morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late, but our guest is having a little bit of connection problem. Problem. So we hope that um, the internet gods will be smiling friendly on us during this broadcast. And if not, I hope that she would consider coming back. This is her second time on the show and she's a very popular guest and maybe she'll even come back once a month like Dr. Lyle's been. She's been described as a kinder, gentler, prettier version of Dr. Lyle. And we're gonna be doing a Q&A today. And some of you have already sent in questions, which is really the best way to get your questions asked when we send out the email every night who the guest is, because then I have it on a piece of paper versus trying to see a ticker tape feed that goes really quickly. If you watched on Sunday, Dr. Lyle did a wonderful explanation on anxiety because so many people asked, this being May Mental Health Awareness Month, the heightened anxiety due to COVID-19. And he pulled the camera back and did a wide angle view of what anxiety is, what causes it. And he, a lot of people were reassured and calmed down, especially when he gave some of the statistics, like we're more likely to die in a car accident than from this virus. But there were a lot of questions left unanswered, specifically, what do we, what do you do about your anxiety right now? And you know, a lot of people have maybe lost their jobs or lost incomes, and they're anxious about that. Other you know, people can't graduate high school, so they're anxious about that, or go to school. People uh, have not been able to go to funerals or visit loved ones in nursing homes. I, I have a friend that actually had a wedding plan for a year and had to get married in a parking lot. So, Dr. Hawk, <laughs> welcome, and what do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is great to be here. And I did, I caught uh, Dr. Lyle's broadcast. So I know that hopefully most people who are watching now were, were there for that and got kind of the evolutionary perspective on what anxiety is and where it comes from. The very back of the envelope thumbnail sketch of that, I, I, won't, I won't go on for an hour um, about it like he did. And you can go back and watch what he said. But essentially it's a, it's a signal. All emotions are signals from the nervous system about your relative relationship to survival and or reproduction in the moment because you're an animal just like any other animal that is designed by nature to survive and reproduce your genes that's your entire purpose in life um, it's not the same thing as the meaning of life like we can talk about we can have a philosophical discussion about the the meaning of life versus the purpose of life but the purpose of life for humans just like for for turtles and for dogs and for earthworms and any other creature is to get your genes into the next generation and emotions um, are our main signaling device they're the main guide that we have to know if we're doing the right thing to survive and or reproduce or not. So if we feel all things equal, if we feel really happy and we feel really good about things, that means we're doing things and we're getting feedback from our environment that is good for our, either our survival odds, our reproduction odds, or both. Um, if it's good for both of those things, we're going to feel really good. We're going to feel really excited, really happy. If we feel anxious, if we feel depressed, if we feel sad, if we feel upset, that's a signal that something is happening in our little world that is, is taking us away from those goals of surviving and or reproducing. So if you think back to your emotional history, you just you can see this pattern is really clear. If you ask someone out on a date and they say yes, you feel elated because the, your, your reproduction odds have just increased you know, wildly. Um, if you get bad feedback from your boss at your job, you feel crappy because that, that's not so good for your survival. That's your income, that's your security. So, so this is the whole, the big picture of what emotions are and how they're trying to help us. They're trying to help us change our behavior to increase our likelihood of survival and or reproduction. So there's a lot of anxiety around this, this pandemic, rightly so, because this is, this is information that's coming into our nervous system that we are estimating is really potentially detrimental to our survival and potentially our reproduction, but it's, it's mostly our survival angst is getting stirred up. And what we're watching is across the population, some people are more anxious than others. Some people are dealing with this information, having a harder time than others. And what you're watching there is the distribution of personality characteristics characteristics in the population. So rule number one of evolutionary psychology is that personality is, is genetic. You're, the way that you react to stress is genetic. The way that you sort of, um, if you're a catastrophizer, if you hear a little bit, bit of bad news and you just go crazy and you spin out and spiral with it, that's a genetic quality that you have. Um, and you can see this distributed in the bell curve among all, all people that you're dealing with. It's like the people who are spinners are like, how can everybody 
everybody remains so calm in the face of this information. And the people who are calm are like, you people need to chill out because it's not that big a deal. So it's all just a big personality derby that we're watching. We're watching people's natural kind of coping mechanisms, their baseline resilience that they that is that is sort of nat natural and innate to them, how it is responding to a signal from the environment that is definitely a stressful signal. But this is this is a real example of how not everybody in the population is going to react the same way to the same stimuli. Um, so the the main main piece of advice is to kind of know know who you are, know what kind of personality you have. Um, we have ways of doing that. There are there's something called the Big Five personality inventory that you can take to kind of discover your core personality characteristics, but you don't even really need to do that. You just kind of need to observe who you are and how you respond to the world historically and now. And, and then it's, there's no special sauce. There's no magic method to this. Everybody kind of wants, you know, what's the, what's the special mantra that I can repeat that will make all of the, all of the anxiety go away, all of the suffering go away. Um, but you know, what I tell people is that sort of the, the Buddhists have had this correct for millennia, you know, it's not, you can't make yourself less comfortable or, or, or more comfortable with anxiety and uncertainty. You can just sort of like learn to accept that you are in a state of great uncertainty and that you, you make friends with it. You make friends with your emotions. You, you develop a little bit of discernment and, and mindfulness for a better word, watching, um, for lack of a better word, to watch yourself, to watch like, how am I as an animal responding to the stimuli that I'm facing? And am I, am I exaggerating my response because I have a personality that is prone to do so? And just to get curious about that and to develop, you know, sort of a witness position to your own emotional landscape. Um, and then to continue to inform yourself about the realities of the situation, which I know Dr. Lyle has talked about with you. We've certainly discussed on the podcast for the last five weeks in a row that this is not this is not the statistical catastrophe that a lot of people think it is. It's, it's, um, it's not that it's not a big deal, it is a big deal, but your individual odds of being affected are, are really quite low, um, and particularly if you're in reasonably good health. So informing yourself with high quality data, um, staying up to speed on uh, all, of, all of the good information and not falling into all of these informational traps that are out there with, um, rumors and bad information and these information entrepreneurs who are trying to get your eyeballs to look at scary headlines on websites or on blogs or whatever. I, I was raised by a pair of, of newspaper journalists, radio journalists, and they always said, if it bleeds, it leads. That was the, that was the guiding light of journalism. Um, and that's what you're watching. You're watching like really scary stories, uh, outliers being promoted and overrepresented in, in the public sphere to get your attention, to get eyeballs on, on the page, on the website, um, to, to get you to watch ads or whatever. So people just need to be very mindful of what kind of information they're consuming um, and then be mindful of how their reaction to it might be informed in some part by personality distortion. Okay, well, that's, that's a wonderful explanation. So you said to pay attention to, you know, accurate information. How do we know when there's such a disparate uh, amount of stuff out there, even from in the plant-based world? So people, it, it, yeah. they get very confused as to who to listen to because we have everything from the sky is falling to this is a hoax and in between. Yeah. So uh, like, what is the trusted source? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have to do the same thing that you do with information about diet, um, which is that none of us, most of us are not trained public health epidemiologists, and most of us are not trained sophisticated statisticians to do a primary analysis of this information. So everybody in the population is beholden to uh, sort of finding, figuring out which expert they do trust, like which, you know, who, which, which member of the Stone Age village do I align my interests with because I, I trust their analysis and, and their intelligence and their ability to make sense of this uncertainty. So that's, that's an individual calculation that people have to make. I'm very sympathetic to that problem. I'm, I'm watching people I have a great deal of intellectual respect for go, in my opinion, pretty far off the rails as far as their analysis goes of the situation. Um, and I would say also that, you know, you got to put your 
analytical hat on for this sort of thing and 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 watch this process through the lens of um, lines have been drawn like partisan lines have been drawn um, people people have a tendency and again this is an evolutionary stone age mechanism where we dig in once we make a public declaration about what we believe to be true the costs of reversing that that declaration that we've made publicly to the stone age village were very disinclined to be like oh my bad i got that wrong. Uh, you know, I got some new information. And I'm going to walk that back and I have a new analysis for you now. That is not something that is really in human nature. Uh, it requires a great deal of intellectual honesty and humility to do that. And, and most people don't have that, particularly if they have a big profile and they're out there in the, in the public space and they're sort of standing behind some kind of analysis. So all of the incentives in psychology are once you've taken a stand, you double down on that, even in the face of contradictory information. And this is an inside game where you you cognitively are really convinced that your position is the correct position you you surround yourself with a lot of informational confirmation bias you don't even give a, a hearing to contradictory information you just really double down on what you what you have established to be true for your your brand and your tribe. And this taps into all kinds of human in-group out-group thinking um, and in the modern sort of social media environment, everybody's got a platform. Everybody, if they tweet something about this, they've sort of taken that, their, their nervous system views that the same way as taking a big public risk in the Stone Age by hanging it all out there and taking a big risk with the public opinion saying, this is what I believe is true. If you're with me, come with me. If you're against me, then we're at war. And that's, what, that's what's really happening in our psyche. And it's mapping onto the political system and it's becoming this sort of cartoonish partisan battle where it's, you know, if you're generally left politically, you're, you're more cautious, you're more, you're more um, accepting of, of extending the quarantine, you're more, um, you're, you're posting more things that are reflecting those biases as far as, oh, well, this is very, very concerning, we're looking at a second wave, we're looking at, uh, we don't know what's happening, it's, we have a lot to still be afraid of, and if you're generally more right on the spectrum. You're like, open up America, open up the economy. Uh, this has gone on long enough. So that's a, that's a very broad and, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating those positions for effect. Obviously, there's a lot of space in the middle. I'm somewhere in the middle. A lot, most people I know are. Um, but that's sort of what you're watching take shape. And I'm a, I'm a trained political scientist, primarily. I'm a social scientist, and, and but political science was my specialty. And I, I can tell you, watching this on the eve of this presidential election, I don't think we have any reason to expect that those those lines now that they're drawn and that this be has become this big pitched partisan ideological battle, like that is going to continue to animate public life for the next several months through the election because now it's become, uh, it's, it's, it's gotten all connected up with the left not wanting to let the, the president have a victory of, of you know, solving the, the COVID crisis um, and, the, and the right pushing the opposite direction. And so this is just getting exaggerated and, and ridiculous. And the truth is very difficult to um, pick out of a situation like that when everybody's got so much um, ego and, and so many interests that are invested in that process. Well, thanks. How about we solve like a particular problem for a particular person? Let's maybe re relate it to this. For example, sure. Stephanie says, yeah. this is an example. So now she's required to wear a mask at work. She's extremely claustrophobic and it's going to be difficult. Any tips on getting her out of her head and handling this without panic? So that's an actual situation. How would you like advise somebody that, that's claustrophobic that now has to wear a mask? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sympathetic to that. I find the masks pretty, pretty claustrophobic myself. Um, and I've had a little bit of luck, like just playing around with different types of fabric and different types of masks. So I would, I would advise you first to do that. So, um, you know, I, I, if they're requiring you to wear a very specific type of mask, that's a very specific sort of problem. But most of these places are, it's, it's anything goes. So I was in the store the other day, and there was a guy walking around with like a bath towel that he had butterfly clipped to his head. And, I'm like, how is that a better public health outcome than, than not wearing a mask? So there's, there's no regulation about what kind of fabric you're using. So I would, I would go for like the lightest material you can find, like one layer. So what's worked for me is just a very thin 
like um, old t-shirt material. It's very, very, very light. Um, and uh, it's very loose, you know, so it fits on my head, but it's loosely fitting me. And so there's room, like air can kind of circulate in and out of there. Obviously this is like no great deterrent to, to the virus, but really probably most of these masks are not any great deterrent. Um, and there's, you know, there's various science on that. It's something of a deterrent and probably overall uh, makes some kind of difference, particularly if, if you're working with a high risk vulnerable population. But if this is just something that you have to do to tick a box to get through the day at work, I would, I would push the envelope as far as you can to make it as comfortable on your face and to get as much air circulating in there as possible. Um, there's really nothing like going back to what I said before, there's no, there's no magical mantra that I can give you to, to diminish that claustrophobia. Um, you will get more comfortable with it over time. Um, just as you sort of like push through that discomfort and, and your nervous system will recalibrate because right now your nervous system having that claustrophobic circuit in there, it's, it's basically inferring that wearing the mask is diminishing your likelihood of survival and, and reproduction, most mostly survival. And so it's running that circuit, it's running that circuit, but the more you do it, the more you actually wear the mask and you go to work um, and you, you come home and you find out that it's fine, that your survival was not diminished, that it was just a little uncomfortable, that, that gently recalibrates your nervous system so it feels less panicky as time goes on. And this works for any kind of exposure therapy. If you have any kind of fear or um, specific anxiety about anything, the more you can kind of just force yourself to do it. We, we you know, st staged exposure therapy where you start with like a small version of the scary thing and you move up to scarier and scarier versions of the real thing. It, it basically just convinces you, oh, hey, I did that thing and I didn't die. So maybe, maybe this is okay. And the nervous system is very good at sort of re reestablishing its inferences and uh, catching up with the calibration over time. Thank you. You know, I find that, uh, like you said, a comfortable is the best way to go. I have a friend that's a, that can sew and she made it with a really soft fabric on the inside and an adjustable nose thing. And now it's, you know, yeah. it's not so bad. It's like getting used yeah. to contact lenses or wearing a watch. Yeah. For me, it's all about having like, so it kind of hangs, but there's air, there's room underneath. So it doesn't like cling to the bottom of my face too. That made a big difference for me in terms of just feeling um, more comfortable with it. Because there, if there's fresh air kind of coming up from underneath, I'm less, less panicky, less anxious about it. The first masks I made were, you know, from the internet tutorials where you like take a piece of fabric and you fold it three times and you do this whole thing and you put the elastics on that was way too thick and way too tight and and was really uh like stressful for me and i i'm not truly claustrophobic i just am a little bit like not a fan especially when it's hot it's getting hot um you know you're, you're going to the store it's really it's it's uncomfortable so if this is something that we sort of need to do for the next couple of months i i am i'm in a hotel right now because my um i'm trying to try and blow out of town and my flight's been canceled four times so i'm just homeless and so i'm living in a hotel um and uh but now it's the airline has officially changed its policy so we have to wear masks the entire time on the flight which is giving me a little bit of anxiety it's like oh my god i have to sit there for six hours wearing this thing um and so that's it, that's not ideal but on the other hand it's it's six hours your work day is eight hours it's it's something you can take breaks you can take it off in the bathroom you know you can take a big deep deep breath of air it's just something that that we have to get through um and until and unless some sanity is restored to the kingdom <laughs> i find at least for me having a very stylish one makes a difference Yes, yes. I uh, I took one of my old T-shirts that had a, a, a cartoon picture of Richard Nixon on it and made a mask out of that. So it, it pleases me to yeah. just advertise my. Well, this is this is what humans are doing all the time with personality. Everything that we buy, basically, there's a there's a great book called Spent by Jeffrey Miller on this, where all of our consumer behavior is essentially just advertising our personality to other people. We're always in the business of look how conscientious I am, look how extroverted I am, look how open to experience or, or um, emotionally stable I am. That's what everything is. If you, if you drive a Jeep instead of a Toyota, you're basically telling the world, I'm very adventurous. I'm open to experience. You should hang out with me because that's the kind of personality I have. So this filters through to our clothes, to our, to our cars, to our houses, um, and now to the kinds, of, the kinds of masks that we choose to wear in public that are also advertising key personality characteristics. It's how we, how we select our coalition and, and find our people. That's very interesting. Uh, Dr. McDougall's birthday is this month, and I got him potato masks. Uh, not oh, me, but hopefully. Excellent. Oh, he's a Taurus. Taurus, that makes sense. Yeah. Seems yep. like a Taurus. So yep. <laughs> yep. 
absolutely. Oh, there. <laughs> it's funny that I, I want to just read you a very nice comment. And uh, somebody wrote, uh, Ter- Tessa wrote, I really like listening to her. The way she explains things and talks clicks for me. If that's true for you, she does do private consultations. And so does Dr. Doug Lyle. And the website is esteemeddynamics.com. And you, you can talk to both of them. And you can listen to them every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. They have over 200 episodes of the Beat Your Genes podcast. So I agree. She has a very calm very way of saying that. Now you had just mentioned uh, exposure therapy. And interestingly enough, the question I was going to ask you that was sent in by Cindy was about exposure therapy. Because on last week's podcast, you talked about your fear of flying and how you can do mm-hmm. exposure therapy. But she said for what she has a phobia of, she has no idea how to approach it. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to paraphrase because it's long, but basically um, she's, she's almost 60. And when she was a teenager, she went into the hospital for what was going to be just to remove a cyst, a same day, go home, operation. She was allergic to the anesthetic. She was resuscitated by respiratory therapists, almost put on a ventilator and in the hospital for three months instead of three hours. And so now her fear is medical procedures, general anesthesia. She can't even get her teeth cleaned. How do you, I mean, you can't just take a little anesthesia here and there to do exposure, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. And it's similar to my, so when I talked in the podcast about my fear of flying, it's sort of, I'm in a similar position because I can't, you also can't just do a you can't fly a little bit, you know, you gotta, you gotta either commit to it or not. You're, you're going on a trip where you're not. Um, and so people who are independently wealthy can hire a pilot and they basically spend the whole day doing takeoffs and landings, takeoffs and landings. And that has a big effect on, on calming them down. And so, you know, in principle, you certainly could, if you had the right connections, um, you know, g- go spend time in a hospital that, that would actually not be a bad idea to just kind of, if, if, I would actually only advise this if you're facing a procedure. If, if you're like, if you get to the point where you're you're up against it and you're actually, you have to have some kind of procedure and you're feeling really terrified of it, then you can start to think about, okay, well, how can I, how can I sneak up to this whole experience in a way that's going to help my nervous system kind of warm up to it a little bit? Otherwise, you're not, this is not something that's going to come up in daily life too often. Um, you know, for the dental stuff, uh, there, I, w- I would suggest, um, you know, they, they have, they have various techniques and, and, you know, sedatives to help with that a little bit, just to get you through it. Um, you could do something like a beta blocker. That's something that I use to fly. So I, you know, I'm, I'm almost seven years sober, so I can't do any kind of, um, any kind of Xanax or anything, but I do, I do take a beta blocker before I fly because it, it basically suppresses the adrenaline in your system. So you don't have the, you don't have the physiological response. So you still feel anxious, but you're not sweating. Your heart's not racing. And, and that kind of, it helps teach you as well. Because if you're not, if your mind is not making the correlation between the sweating and the heart racing and the, and the freak out and the activity, it starts to kind of short circuit the, the correlation. And so your nervous system is sort of like, well, hold on, maybe we're not afraid of this thing because we're not experiencing all of the physiological cues. So that's helped me a lot with flying. Um, and that's a non-addictive, I mean, it's, you'd have to talk to your doctor to see if you, you have any reason that you wouldn't want to take it. Certainly it's not ideal for everybody, but it's a very kind of subtle thing that can be useful in that kind of case, if you if you don't want to, you know, do any kind of harder, harder drug, um, which I would not advise doing. But mostly this is just something that's not going to come up that often in your life. It's it's, you know, most people are not going in for procedures that require anesthesia on a regular basis. So I would not not stress yourself out too much about it until you're really in a position where you do have to confront something and you do have to do it. And at that point, we can really look at just go sit in the hospital waiting room. Um, you know, just, just like I will go sit at the airport a couple of hours ahead of time and I'll watch the plane. So I'm not going up and down in them, but I am sort of sensitizing myself to, oh, look, that one took off and it was fine. Oh, that one landed and it was fine. And it's just like you watch and you watch and you watch and it's just, you know, hundreds of them. And so if you're sitting there and you're just kind of watching the, the traffic at a hospital, that, that might be helpful as well. Well, Chuck says, I'm an airplane pilot and I get a bit nervous when sitting in the back as a passenger. I think it has something to do with not being in control. Oh, it's totally not being in control. And that's, and that's why I talked on the podcast about all my little rituals that I have, which may help me feel more in control, which I think is a very adaptive thing that a lot of people do around fears and anxieties they have. They're like, and this is, you know, you take that far enough out the bell curve and that's where you get something that we would call OCD. So, so OCD is just a more, you just go down the continuum where you get the kind of like 
nervous little ritualistic behavior that I have before an airplane flight and you you jack it up to the point where you really just can't walk out of the house until you check the stove 17 times. So it's this is it's all the same circuits, it's the same brain that's running the same inferences and the same the same pattern of behavior. But again, this is where personality and sort of just who you are as a human comes into the environment and intersects to give you a particular outcome. Where if I were more unstable on the on the stability spectrum, um, which is one of the big five personality characteristics. I happen to be extremely stable, thank goodness. It really helps me deal with this kind of stuff. But if I was very unstable, I would have a much harder time. That would make me more of a perseverator, more of a, I'd have, a, I'd be more anxious. It would be a hard, you know, might, might actually get in the way of making these plans for myself. So as it is, I like, I don't like it, but I do it. Um, and I just push through it. And I know that it's going to be shitty and uncomfortable, but I just kind of, I, I have enough kind of just suck it up circuits in my nervous system from that stability that I, I just get through it. And every time I do it, like when I'm flying regularly, there was a time when I had first started grad school where I was dating somebody back in Seattle. So I was going back and forth from Boston to Seattle every week practically. Um, and it did like, I, I sort of started to recognize the actual planes. I'm like, oh, this is the same plane I took last Tuesday, um, the same flight attendants. Like it began to get in enough of a routine that I was, um, I was much, much more relaxed about it. So uh, that was the closest that I've come to having true exposure therapy. And the longer I go without flying, the more I build it up in my mind and the more anxious I get. So this is gonna work the same way where your nervous system's always just trying to make an estimate. It's taking information and it's trying to estimate what are my chances of survival and reproduction? And the longer it goes without true information and just relies on your own brain cooking things up, the more distorted that inference gets and the more prone to error it gets. So the best thing always for, for you to make good inferences and to, to engage in productive behavior around that, that inference is to make sure that you've got real undistorted information about the situation and that you're not just feeding in your, your fears and, or your hopes or um, my dog is making some noise over there. We're living dangerously in the hotel room because there's nothing to do with the dog. So they're just kind of hanging out and they're being good so far, but they, they could always, there could be barking and it could get very exciting. <laughs> Terrific. There's two questions on beta blockers, so I'll ask them both together. Mm -hmm. Kathy says, is it by prescription and, and what is the name? And Caroline says, do they make you sleepy? Could you take it before a job interview? I've never heard of beta blocker. I mean, it's not that I've never heard of them. I've never heard of them used like this. Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, it's by prescription, but it's, uh, it's you know, fairly straightforward. They're, they're used by a lot of people. And um, I sort of first heard about them by people using them on stage, people who had sort of stage fright, um, because it's, uh, if, if people do have like a big presentation or something, they will, it just kind of takes that adrenaline anxiety edge off, particularly if people get physiologic like if they get really shaky or their voice gets really shaky and they have to do a performance, um, it's something that's recommended too. It's obviously this is all off usage uses for it, but it's it's pretty side effect free for most people. It can um, it can mess with your blood pressure. So if you've got very low blood pressure naturally, it's probably not the best for you because it's going to lower your blood pressure even more. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm in no position to give specific advice to people about this. But if you talk to your doctor about it, they're they're going to be able to tell you what the appropriate dosage would be and um, if, it's, if it's something that makes sense for you. It does make you a little sleepy. Um, that's, the, that's the main sort of effect that I get. My, my main challenge with, with using it on a flight is that essentially caffeine will cancel it out. So I have to make sure that I don't have a cup of coffee if I'm gonna take a flight because it's, based, it, it's fighting the adrenaline from the caffeine to try to suppress the adrenaline with the beta blocker and then I'm just, there's no point to the whole thing. So part of the sleepiness is also slight caffeine withdrawal. So I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone would have that effect or just caffeine addicts like I do. Um, but it does, it's, it's a very, it gives you, um, it's not a big effect. It's a very, it just kind of, just kind of blunts it just very, very slightly. Um, and, and you do, it's, it's sort of startling to watch yourself kind of like, well, I do feel like I'm anxious about the situation, but I'm not, I'm not escalated physically about it. Um, and that is that's just more more information for your nervous system. Yeah. See, I, I'm I'm a very anxious person, but part of my anxiety is I'm afraid to take drugs. So I would actually be afraid to take that. Uh, oh yeah. Well, that's that's you know I basically am completely anti medication almost always, and certainly anti anything that would um, be any kind of opiate or any sort of like any anything that has any addictive qualities. So for me, this is just it's it's you know 
three times a year. I mean, it sounds I, great. Like, I mean, it sounds yeah. like a great option because I have a yeah. big fear of anything like like medical or whatever. And yeah. like, I, I never heard of it. So thank you. Adam, yeah. who is watching live from England says, are anxiety and excitement similar emotions? Um, they can be. So it, it's all about... It's, it, again, it goes back to your, your inference about your survival and reproduction. So anxiety, anxiety is almost sort of, you can, you can definitely feel anxious in an excited sort of way. If, if your likelihood of success at any particular goal that you have is starting to get up the, like if you can imagine that there's sort of a scale of likelihood of success of, of meeting some sort of goal, um, like let's say you're, you're asking you're asking the, the, your, your big crush to the prom, you know? So you can imagine that there's the scale of emotion that accompanies that with your perceived probability of success of them saying yes. So if your perceived probability of them saying yes is a hundred percent, you're, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be happy about it. Although if it's truly a hundred, you're also not, you're not that excited. You're kind of, you're kind of bored. It's probably your high school girlfriend and you, you there's no anxiety in the system at all. It's like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to ask her out and she's, she's certainly going to say yes. So, so that's cool. If your perceived probability of success of asking them out and having them say yes is zero, you're going to be super depressed because it's like, well, what's the point? I don't even want to ask them. It's just this whole situation is very depressing. But the sweet spot between zero and a hundred is where you start to get feelings like anxiety, um, sort of feeling stressful feelings. So the closer you're moving up the scale where you're actually starting to get to a point where you're, you're looking at potential success, that starts to generate some anxiety in the system because it's basically bringing all of your faculties online. It's saying, hey, pay very close attention because we've got some survival and reproduction stakes here and we need to make sure that we do the right thing to secure this goal that we're going for. Um, if your odds are 100 or zero, you don't, you don't get that same kind of agitation happening in your nervous system. So that's, that's like excited anxiety. Um, and then of course, if you have if, if, you, if you're having anxiety about a bad outcome, it's a similar process. It's, it's like your, your estimate that the bad thing is gonna happen is somewhere between zero and 100. It's not, it's not 100 because then you would just be sort of fatalistic and, and like, well, it's, you know, the, the, the asteroid is going to hit us in five minutes, so what are you gonna do? Like, goodbye world. Um, and if it's, you know, it's, it's somewhere, it's like, there seems to be something that I should do to change this outcome in a direction that would be better for my survival or reproduction odds. Therefore, I'm going to generate all of the, this emotional response to try to get me to move in that direction. So anxiety is, is trying to help you. Um, but again, if you have if you have a personality type that is more prone to sort of overestimating the worst case scenario, which means that you're probably either a very conscientious person or a very emotionally unstable person or both, you are going to hit that anxiety threshold before somebody else will, given the same situation. So it's just, this is where we wanna know who we are and how we deal with things. Great, we have a compliment from Laura. Dr. Jen looks like she's lost a lot of weight since the live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference in Vegas, would she mind telling us how much weight she has lost? <laughs> um, since Vegas, now see, I'm gonna blush. I should have taken a beta blocker before. <laughs> um, I, I've lost about 100 pounds total from when I first started um, the process with, uh, I started with the sort of basic McDougal program. And then as I got closer and closer, I've had to really tighten the screws a little more. So now I eat more of a, of a Chef AJ style kind of diet, which is very hard to do when you're living in a hotel room. So there's definitely, um, you know, I don't have a microwave, I don't have an oven, I don't I have a tiny little fridge. Um, but uh, yeah, probably it's been about, uh, you know, it's like somewhere between three and four pounds a month generally. Um, so, you know, whatever that is since, since the conference. So, well, so you look, yeah. You look beautiful. Oh, well, I appreciate that in my, my hotel lockdown, <laughs> eating a lot of bananas. <laughs> I do have my Vitamix with me, which is keeping me sane. So people who know me know that I um, am totally obsessed with banana cilantro smoothies, which is hilarious because uh, followers of Dr. Lyle know that he is very anti cilantro and I like cannot get enough cilantro. So my favorite smoothie is actually a, a banana cilantro smoothie, sometimes with some spinach in there. So I've been having a lot of those, which is very alarming to him. 
That's great. Cheryl says, have a session with you. It's fantastic. And Sue says, I love Dr. Hawk. She is beautiful. So you have your fans oh, here. Oh, you guys are so, so nice. sweet. Thank you. Have, you. have you noticed either people you know or people you talk to, there's a certain segment of people. And again, when I say this, I'm not saying that I'm happy that there's a pandemic, that people are dying, losing their jobs. But I... I'm a very anxious person and I have never been happier or calmer, not with the pandemic part, but with the sheltering <laughs> at home. And, and then sure. I feel guilty that I like it. But the more I talk to people, they're like, because people think I'm an extrovert because of my job, but I'm really not. No, and you're a disagreeable introvert. This is paradise for you. This is ideal for you. And this is what we see. This is like personality is just splayed out over social media. So if you look at your social media feed and you watch what people are posting, the people who have personalities who are going to thrive in this kind of situation are disagreeable introverts, high, high conscientious disagreeable introverts. You are the poster child of, of somebody who would be very, very happy in this kind of situation. It's like it's hitting all your circuits just right. You're like, yeah, keep all all of the, the jerks at home and I, I can I can still function and everything's fine. Whereas people who are, you know, super agreeable extroverts are having a really hard time because it's like they can't people people, um, you know, I'm pretty introverted as well. I'm similar to you where people always think that I'm more extroverted than I am because I'm open and I'm stable. So I'm, I'm, I can be social, but my preference is always to hide at home with my dogs. So I'm actually quite introverted and I'm not I'm not suffering as much in this situation as some people are because of that. Um, and and I'm, I'm quite stable and conscientious as well. So it's like, it's, it's a pretty good mix of personality characteristics. But uh, people forget that um, extroverts, extroverts suffer just as much from lack of social contact as introverts suffer when you throw them into some social situation that they don't wanna go to. So all of the anxiety that an introvert feels if you drop them into some party where it's like, just go socialize. Imagine that feeling that is what an extrovert feels like a true extrovert feels when they can't connect with other humans and they're stuck at home and they they, they don't know when they're going to be able to leave it's actually very difficult for them so you get disagreeable extroverts that's who's storming the state house in Michigan and everywhere else. They, they are like, hey, enough's enough. This is really uncomfortable for my personality. And I don't see this changing anytime soon. And so my cost benefit analysis is starting to change on taking action around this. And I'm going to go out there and even put myself at risk or put other people at risk to try to secure a different outcome. And of course, it goes back to what I was saying before with people sort of uh, drawing lines in the sand and affiliating themselves with a certain ideological tribe. And that's all part of it as well. But essentially, your comfort level with the current situation and your, your feelings about it and what you think everybody should do as a result is just a litmus test. It's a projection of your own personality bias. So that's the first place to start. I actually wrote an essay about this in my first um, first newsletter that I sent out about this called of personalities in pandemics so people can find that on my website where it's really you're 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 just watching you're watching how conscientious people are you're watching how open to experience they are how agreeable they are how introverted they are that's that's really and how stable you are you're getting just the whole spectrum of personality uh getting amplified and exaggerated by this situation wow I have to, so that's on your website jenhawk.com yeah, yeah, I've got in my little article section, I have a backlog of my newsletters there. So. I have to read that. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I had, I mean, you are explaining the pan, the people's responses to the pandemic in terms of personality. That could be like a whole book. That's incredible. Yeah, well, we talk a lot about that in the book that we're in, we're writing, not that we're writing, not the pandemic specifically, but how important personality is for how you see the world and how you, you are just essentially filtering life through through the lens of your personality. There's a wonderful quote from Anais Nin that's been around forever, which is a lot of people have probably heard this, but not really thought about it in these terms, which is we do not see things as they are, we see them as we are. And that is really the central tenet of, of the way that we approach evolutionary psychology through behavioral genetics, which is you see the world as you are. You've got what we call egocentric bias, which is informing your inferences, your cost benefit analyses about what is the best thing to do, how the world should be that you are a snowflake. You've got your little personality distribution and you, are, you exist on points of the bell curve that other people don't, even people that you may be very close to and certainly people that you don't know very well. You've got the full continuum out there walking around and they have every right to their opinion of what, what the world should look like as you do. And it, it, it's probably very different from yours. So you can't, you're just lost trying to understand human behavior until you understand personality. 
And would, do you think reading that book Blueprint would help us understand personality a little bit? Yeah, Blueprint's a wonderful book. It's um, it's by uh, a psychologist and behavioral geneticist called um, Robert Plowman, uh, and it's a little lofty. It's a little academic and a little lofty, and it's a little tough, little, little rough sledding to read for some people. You can find um, speeches that he's made at various places, talks that he's given at Google and elsewhere on YouTube. Um, it's Plowman, P-L-O-M-I-N, and the book is called Blueprint, How DNA Makes Us Who We Are. So Plowman is great because he was one of the original researchers researchers who embarked on the, um, the Minnesota twin studies, which was the sort of the first really concerted effort for uh, researchers to discern between nature and nurture, which was having a bigger effect on human behavior. And decisively, these twin studies where they took identical twins who were raised in incredibly different environments, uh, they turned out to be really similar if you track them through over the course of their life in, in every important way that you can measure. So IQ, whether they were obese, what kind of car they drove. Um, there was even a very high incidence of, of marrying people with the same name because the sound of the name was pleasing to their ear, like innately. So genes are really driving the show. Um, and these twin studies, which have been replicated over 15 million times now, have really closed the door on the, on the so-called nature-nurture debate. It really is nature. Nurture, all nurture is, is it's a way to sort of um, define the experience of, of a child for the duration of their childhood. Certainly it matters. It matters to give kids a good environment as they grow up, but you're not changing who they are. You're not shaping who they are. They are who they are. They're going to become who they are. Just like my two dogs have very distinct personalities. I give them as, as nice and as calm and as loving of a home as I can because I care about their life experience, but I in no way can change their personality. I've got one disagreeable stable one and one agreeable unstable one and that's just what they are they're being really good that's perfect. <laughs> yeah so since we can't change our personality i shouldn't feel guilty that i'm enjoying it because i'm <laughs> a disagreeable conscientious introvert Yes, yeah, you really are. You're, this is this is just perfect for you. So yeah, you shouldn't feel guilty about it, but you should definitely have some mindfulness around the fact that it's um, just because it's a really good situation for you doesn't mean that it's a good situation for everybody. And it also doesn't mean that it's your your ideas about how things should be are should be universally embraced by everybody. Um, so this is one of the ways in which evolutionary psychology sort of takes you in a more politically libertarian direction. Just just as you as you sort of recognize behavioral genetics, it's like oh gosh everybody really is coming at life from very different perspectives. And so it would be, it would be really kind of unfair of me to impose my estimate of what's best for them uh, because they have, they just have a very different view of reality. So it sort of gives you this, this latitude to give, just let people, let people be who they are and have the life experience that is optimal for them. But so, yeah, I think disagreeable people often fall into the trap of if, Hey, it's good for me. It's good for everybody. Keep it this way. Like we, <laughs> we have no reason to change it. But so just, just some empathy for the fact that a lot of people are uh, struggling with it at the personality level, particularly the agreeable extroverts who just want to get out there and, and hang out and take selfies and post them on Instagram and bars. That is so <laughs> funny. God, you're really explaining things so well. Uh, Jean says, Jeff, AJ, I thought you were an extrovert. No, I'm a forced extrovert because, you know, I was very shy as a kid and it wasn't until I had all this acting, you know, I was just, that's, that's who I would have been if I did, wasn't forced into this. You know, I'm very happy. I actually prefer doing this, interviewing other people where I barely speak than having to get up in front of 2000 people on the cruise and get oh. a lecture. So interesting. Is, I found my niche. Yeah. So uh, the airplane pilot, Chuck said, this is, <laughs> this is some good. And thank you, Chuck, for being here. And this is some great information, Chuck, that I wish I had before I had panic attacks on airplanes, which because I do not like to fly. Um, and it's not so much the flying I'm afraid of. It's just I don't like the feeling of the anxiety that it causes. And airports are even more stressful, I think, sometimes than the plane. But Chuck says, mm. for our nervous airline passengers, if they let us know ahead of time, we bring them on board before general boarding and let them sit in the captain's seat on the right deck and go over how things work. Seems to take the mystery out of out and personalize the crew, which seems to help. Most airlines do this, and for sure, Southwest. I did not know this. I love Southwest Airline, by the way. If I, I it, we don't have it, unfortunately, where I live anymore. But that is such great information. I did. I'm going to ask for that next time. This sounds. Yeah, great. I thought that. I thought that was only something they did for kids. You know, I didn't didn't think that you could do that as an adult. I'm not sure if that would help me or not because part of part of my be, my approach to it is sort of like 
you know, I, it's not really happening. You know, it's like, like I, I sort of go to my happy place where it's not really a plane, you know, I'm sort of, I just pretend that I'm in a room and, and it's a room that's a little bumpy. And so I don't, I don't, I don't like to tune into the fact that I actually am 30,000 feet in the air on, on an airplane. So I'm not, I think people, people should, you know, if they think that, that, if they feel, if they resonate with that and it feels like it would be helpful, absolutely go for it. Um, one thing that did help me a little bit uh, paradoxically just along these lines is I, when I did my field work uh, for my dissertation in Alaska, I was working in Western villages, these, these Alaska native villages, very small remote populations. Um, I, was, I was writing a dissertation about sort of indigenous Alaskan responses to climate change. Um, and I, so I had to fly to these villages and the only way in is on very, very tiny planes, like little five-seater planes. Um, and they are terrifying. However, I had an easier time with those planes than I do with the jets because you're more you're just more in tune with the with the actual forces at play. Like there's no there's no doubting for a second that you are in an aircraft that just got lift and it just took off and you feel every little motion of wind and everything. And there was something about that, like connecting to the actual physics of it that was very reassuring to me um, where I was like, okay, well, just like when you kind of stick your hand out of a car window, this is my dad's favorite trick when I was a kid. If you stick your hand out a car window shaped like an airplane wing, it lifts. You can feel like the air rushing underneath your hand and it wants to lift. So I felt that uh, when I was in the little plane and there was there was something about that that was very reassuring. Um, those bush pilots are are like seriously reckless crazy dudes though they like they do these crazy hairpin turns and they want to come in fast and show off for the ladies so that was not as reassuring but the rest of the experience was great Linda <laughs> says uh, awesome interview thank you for getting Jen back Jen you have an open invitation if you even just feel like it to go live just just text me and I'm like you go oh, live right sure. now people want to know your banana cilantro smoothie is it just banana and cilantro or are there more ingredients Oh, well, so I have a couple of variations. So the important thing, the, the, the thing that makes it the best, which is unfortunately something I can't do right now because my freezer is like this tiny little mini fridge freezer that doesn't even work that, that well. Ideally, you start with frozen bananas and you let them just thaw a little bit. So, you know, let them sit out for 15 minutes or something so they're not rock hard. Um, and then I don't add any water or anything. I just take those mostly still pretty frozen bananas and I add in the cilantro and sometimes I'll just do that. So it's good to have a really good blender. So the Vitamix, you can really beat it into submission and, and get it. It's like a very thick, very cold, almost a nice cream kind of consistency at that point. So if you like a soupier smoothie, you can add some almond milk or some water. Um, sometimes I will add some spinach as well, just to get some extra greens in there. So I'll throw some baby spinach in, which you can't really taste. The cilantro is the very strong flavor. Um, and sometimes I will add what I'm doing right now is the freezer's not big enough for bananas, but it is big enough for a little bag of frozen mango. So I have some chopped frozen mango in there that I just got in the freezer section. So I throw a few of those in, which adds some coldness to the the room temperature bananas in the cilantro so you can play around with it and see what you like but it's it's sort of like if you like mango salsa like if you've ever had like a mango salsa with that mix of sweet and herby kind of flavor then you might like it if you're a cilantro lover it's very unusual but it's very good thank you uh, let's see where we're going next oh, what i want to say is people are asking to see your dogs but one of the reasons i can fly now is because i got my dog bailey trained as a service dog for my panic disorder and it's a lot easier to fly with a service dog because yeah because i yeah. don't want to take medicine so that's what's can, helped me you can you can let me see if i can show you they're over here there they are oh my god they're <laughs> adorable yeah oh <laughs> they're god they're, they're so they're, cute illegally snoozling on the hotel bed so we just won't tell management but they're, know, they're, saw, doing, they're, they're precious <laughs> i saw a question from jan but now i can't find it and i can't remember she said our to overweight people tend to be more introverted i i don't think that's is is your way to function of your personality at all no um not not in that causal direction but it could be in the in the other causal direction so one thing that'll often happen is that women who are overweight and i've watched this in my own personality when i weighed 100 more pounds than i did now i was both more um 
I don't know if I was more introverted because I, I've got a little bit of noise in my data because I uh, am a recovering alcoholic. So I was more extroverted when I was drinking, um, but I definitely was more agreeable. So this is something that you'll see because you're essentially not in as much of a position of power. You're, you're in a position of weakness relative to all of the different value propositions that you're seeking as you go through life. So your, your relationship with your, your coworkers and your boss, any kind of romantic relationship, if you are significantly overweight, you, you are basically going through life in a position of weakness relative to other, other women. And so it makes you, if you've got sort of room in the expression of your personality, a lot of people will become more agreeable. They're more deferential because they're, they're estimating that they're less valuable, essentially, is what's going on there. So they're, they're more willing to accept uh, kind of a bad deal in their relationships. They're not going to raise a fuss. They're not going to set boundaries as well. They're not going to generate conflicts um, because they're they're perceiving that on the market they're not going to be able to get a better relationship. So so you will you'll watch that sort of thing. And I can I can understand that working for introversion as well. If you if you're not estimating that you're a very good uh, value proposition on the on the dating market or on the on the social market, you're going to run the cost benefit analysis and it's going to tell you to stay home and watch Netflix. So that's going to be a personality dependent thing and sort of where you're where you sit pre-existing on the spectrum. But I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that the, there's a correlation in the other causal direction where more introverted people are more likely to, to gain weight. The only one that might exist is um, if you're highly emotionally unstable, uh, that you're, you're sort of a person who's more likely to celebrate and medicate with food because you're seeking dopamine wherever you can find it more than the average bear. So that could lend itself to um, obesity. So could low conscientiousness. If you've got very low conscientiousness, you're gonna have a very hard time uh, eating a healthy diet, staying on track with any particular diet. Um, so those two traits are are going to make it more challenging for you. But you know, even you you could be, super unstable, low conscientious flake, incredibly extroverted and open to experience and super agreeable and unable to say no. All of those things are liabilities as far as dealing with the pleasure trap, but it's still not a problem for obesity if you're not eating pleasure trap food. You're still not overweight in the stone age because there's no super normal food that you can get your snout into. So if you're living in the modern environment, it becomes a problem to have those personality characteristics because it makes it more likely that you're gonna get into super normal food and run into trouble. Uh, but if that food was not available, you would still have those personality characteristics and they did in the stone age, but they would just be celebrated medicating with berries and tubers and whatever sort of stone age food was around and it would be fine. So, so it's still, the problem is always the pleasure trap. The problem is always super normal food. If you were overweighted, it's because you were eating too much food that is not compatible with the species. Um, so at some level you need to dial down the, the processed nature of your food. Great. Stephanie says, Dr. Jen, thank you for being honest about your anxiety and struggles and weight struggles and the fact that you have handled them with strength. It's inspiring. And thank Sylvan you. said something in response. I just, that was a good comment. Sorry, it goes very fast. Uh, Sylvan says, yes, I feel more valuable, strong, and less agreeable since losing weight. So basically, I was always a disagreeable bitch, but when I was 60 pounds heavier, I didn't feel like I could manifest it. Yes. Yeah. I've been watching myself get more disagreeable. I, I am, I'm not a disagreeable person. I'm quite an agreeable person, but I'm not a, I'm not a doormat. I'm an area rug. So I do, I hit my disagreeable boundaries a little earlier than I did when I had a lot more weight on me. I'm much more likely to sort of be like, no, too far. You've chiseled my goodwill enough and that is it. And I am out of this whole dynamic. So, whereas hundred pounds ago, 50 pounds ago, I was much less likely to do that. And I you're, put up with a right. lot of really crappy relationships as a result. So this is actually people who, who believe that they're codependent. If you've been told by your therapist that you're a codependent, which I was told for 20 years, um, because I grew up in a family of alcoholics and addicts, and I had trouble setting boundaries, and I kept falling in love with other alcoholics. All that means is that you're an agreeable, conscientious person, and that you're trying to clean up other people's messes, and that you're probably in some kind of position of weakness relative to your own self-perception of your market value. So that would be the first place to start is get yourself in a position of power at every level that you can. Great, I love, you're an area rug. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Persian rug. You're a Persian rug, how stylish. 
I'm classic just, for the, the Aries in the house. <laughs> so kidding. So in the last few minutes, you know, I listen to your podcast religiously. I usually listen to it the first time, just kind of let it wash. And then the second time I actually kind of take notes on it, especially if it's a subject I'm interested in. And you said some really brilliant, I mean, you always say brilliant things, but this last one you said, and of course, and when I agree with you, it's even more brilliant, but you talked yeah. a little bit about the environment, but you had a saying that I never heard you say it this way before, and I'm going to read it, but you talked about how the environment is not just the best defense against the pleasure trap. It's the only defense that people yeah. believe their willpower is causing their success, and it isn't. And then I love how you, you said they'll look for a dopamine drip on the lowest branch they can find. I never yes. heard it said that way, but I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. And I can see it in my own psychology. Like it's, it is freaking hard trying to stay out of the pleasure trap when you're living in a hotel room. Like when you're in a pandemic, you're living in a hotel room. It's not like I'm going on any dates. It's like, there's nothing going on. I'm safe way is two blocks away. It's, it's hard. And so I've got enough conscientiousness and enough stability and I'm highly motivated, but it's, it's not like this, this goes away as a constant sort of like, I am I am an animal who is seeking dopamine when I'm stressed, just like every animal wants dopamine when they're stressed. So, so the environment, you, you really, that is the only thing you can do. So for me, that translates to this current situation where I just keep the hotel room stocked with compliant things where I'm able to just like constantly sort of eat. Um, because you, you basically think of yourself as an animal who you're running a script in your head that's always what like what sex food, sex food, sex food, what's the next best use of my limited time and energy to ensure survival and or reproduction? The answer to that is almost always gonna be either something that is directly engaging with sex or food, or it gets you in a position where those things are gonna be more closer, closer to you and easier to get. So if you're not actually going, you know, to go find a partner, you're you're working on your display, your personality display, you're trying to find a job to make you a more attractive mate, you're doing something that's moving you in a direction of ensuring greater reproductive success. Um, and so you're always, you're always circling around going, what's the easiest thing that I could do to solve these survival and reproduction problems? So I, if I didn't have a hotel room full of oatmeal and bananas and things to snack on, that little relentless little, little ticker in my head would eventually start saying, hey, go to Safeway, get some super normal food, get something else super normal. Like this is just what it's going to be. It's always going to be there. So your only defense against it is to, is to try to buffer yourself with, um, with things that you, you know that this is the behavior you're going to engage in. So way better to have another bowl of oatmeal than to go get a vegan pizza. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are saying they're overeating now, even on compliant yeah. food and other people are just oh, totally. pouring in the towel and eating crap. But you know, it's interesting, at least with the, the clients that I have, you know, I'm a big fan of eating at home and making your own food. I've always said that yeah. restaurants are the kiss of death for anyone trying to lose weight yeah. and suffers with food addictions. And these people that fought me on it saying, oh no, the food I'm getting, it's compliant. It's not because there's always oil, sugar, and salt in it, even when of you course. ask for none first time in their life, they're actually losing weight because the social, they can't, they can't socialize. They can't go to restaurants. And they're like, Oh, you were right. Makes me yeah. We talked, we talked about that on the podcast that um, Dylan Holmes had this great little plant rant that he did where it's the number one thing that we hear that people have trouble staying compliant because of the social pressure. it's like, well, we've taken the social pressure away. So it's just you, you're just at home with your food, but it is, you're going to be eating because eating is always like the, almost always the best solution to your survival reproduction problems, particularly when you're stressed, when you're stressed and you kind of like, you're like, what can I do? That's a sure thing. That's going to improve my odds of genetic survival. I know I could eat something. So you're going to want to just like chew on things because even healthy food gives you a little dopamine drip. So let yourself chew on healthy compliant food have like, don't worry about overeating on compliant food generally. Um, you know, just, just allow yourself to sort of get into that. That is, that is not what we're going to worry about. What we're worried about is the, the super normal food that you're going to order and have delivered to the house. Yeah. Debbie says she feels like she's always chasing dopamine. Don't go chasing dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so, great. Yeah. We'll just, That's oh. what we're wired to do. We'll just end on a fun question. Is there anything that you're watching now, maybe on Netflix or Amazon Prime, or maybe you don't watch anything? But if you are, we'd love to know what shows you watch. Um, so I, uh, I, I just, <laughs> I have a friend who's been watching house of cards. So I got back into that, which, you know, is just like, 
it's like candy for my political science soul. Very, very fun. Um, I'm a big fan of The Crown. The Crown is awesome, particularly the first season. So if you guys haven't watched that, it's sort of the mix of the, the interpersonal family drama of the royal family. And then the history of it is very exciting for anybody who's sort of historically or politically minded. Um, so those have been the main, those have been the main things that I'm watching. I'm definitely like a series binger. Like I get into something and I just go crazy. I have a friend who's really trying to get me into Killing Eve and I love Sandra O oh, and I am um, the other woman in that who uh, has the Fleabag show. Fleabag was also great if people haven't watched Fleabag. So, um, so that's probably next up in my queue. It's good to know that you've gotten doctors are real people. This all started when I interviewed Dr. Furman. <laughs> we found out what he liked to watch. And I just love hearing what people like. What to watch. does he oh. watch? Well, he, he loved, he loved Game of Thrones. Oh, Game of Thrones is just a little viscerally violent for me. I have a hard time, like, you know, watching the babies thrown out of towers and, you know, just like eaten by birds and all this crap that goes on. So it's a little rough for me to watch. So like the House of Cards, also very violent, but, you know, political and interesting. So probably very similar, actually, just a little less gruesome. <laughs> I'm with you on Game of Thrones. We got through to part of the second episode and it looked like they were going to hurt a dog and we never could watch it again. That episode, actually, that was where I stopped too. Well, ironically, the the first, I don't think it's a huge spoiler to say that House of Cards and the pilot, there, there's there's also a similar, I almost didn't keep watching because there's a there's some violence to a dog that happens. So it's like, it's these are... These are difficult things. Oh, speaking of pilots with violence, Deadwood is my favorite show of all time. If people have ever watched Deadwood, it's actually probably getting time for me to go, just watch the whole series again. Um, Deadwood is also pretty gruesome and violent, but freaking amazing. And the first episode has some gratuitous violence in it as well against women, but it's um, it's a great show. It's a great show with a very foul mouth. <laughs> what are you, are you reading anything special? I am reading, I'm, I'm slowly working my way through Charles Murray's new book, which is probably like right behind me called Human Diversity. Um, so he is the infamous author of The Bell Curve, a co-author of The Bell Curve, which um, came out, you know, probably you know, going on 20 years ago now, more than 20 years ago. Um, and this is his latest effort, which is sort of a, a summa of all of the research having to do with um, a lot, a lot having to do with sex differences, sort of the behavioral genetics behind the, the, the differences that we see in the population in terms of, of uh, sex, race, and class. Um, and so he's, he's, this is like a real comprehensive literature review um, that he has brought just decades of research to. So yeah, very little light reading. <laughs> you are a smarty pants man you just you're that's impressive well it's, it's always so fun talking to you Rachel says when I understood the pleasure trap my life changed and nobody explains the pleasure trap better than Dr. Hawk or Dr. Lyle so please listen to their podcast they have over 200 episodes and I, I always recommend episode 161 where the uh, the pleasure trap and the ego trap are explained because that's mm -hmm. a big problem for a lot of people but they're over 200 now and you can always get a private consultation with ego either of them or both, you know, because I mean, what could be better? So thanks so much, Dr. Hawk. It's really fun talking to you. Oh, it's always, always a pleasure. We can chat anytime while I just languish in my hotel for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and next time, you know, I have an idea. Next time you actually have a real kitchen, maybe as part of the broadcast, you can actually make your smoothie. Oh my God. I just made it yesterday. It's so, it's so good. Yeah. There, there will be another one happening soon. So there's really no magic to it. It's pretty basic, but um, I recommend for the, my fellow cilantro lovers, which is genetic as well. If you love cilantro, it's because you have the cilantro gene. So um, I am in solidarity with you. It actually just, I mean, I, I don't have a strong opinion on cilantro either way, but it just sounds really good. It sounds yeah. excellent. Very yeah. sweet, refreshing, sort of herbal. It's very, I, I go for it in the summertime in particular. That's, that sounds great. So thank you guys for being here live and please come back in, it, uh, what time today? 1 p.m. Come back in an hour when I'll be speaking with a cardiologist named Dr. Stephen Letterman. He's the father of Matt Letterman from the movie Forks Over Knives and he was requested by people watching live. Thanks again, Dr. Hawk. Be well and I hope your plane <laughs> takes off at some point. <laughs> awesome, sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye.